Tonight, one last go around for sports balls. We take you up to the bank for the NCATA championships. And we cover everything on main campus from baseball to lacrosse. All that and a whole lot more coming up on Sports Paws. Right now. Sixteen shows down, one to go. That's right, tonight's Sports Pause closes another chapter as the Quinnipiac school year comes to an end. Good evening, everyone. I'm Arthur Lane. And I'm Mark Spillane. Tonight, we recap the past week of Quinnipiac athletics in our final show of the school year. From baseball to lacrosse to the track, we have it covered. But first, we begin with acrobatics and tumbling. This weekend, Quinnipiac hosted its first national championship when the acrobatics and tumbling world came to Hamden. Azusa Pacific, Baylor, Fairmont State, and Oregon all participated alongside Quinnipiac up at the TD Bank Sports Center. Quinnipiac took home two individual events on Thursday. In the Twisting Pyramid, the Bobcats, Azusa Pacific, and Oregon all finished with a score of 9.85 for the first three-way tie in NCATA history. The Bobcats later tied the Oregon Ducks in the release pyramid as they both posted scores of 9.9. .9. Friday began, began the team competition as Quinnipiac took on Azusa Pacific in the first semifinal. Our own Steph Asano breaks down the weekend. The Quinnipiac Acrobatics and Tumbling team took on Azusa Pacific Friday night in the NCATA semifinals at the TD Bank Sports Center, hoping to advance to the finals. Azusa started off strong with a great compulsory pyramid in the compulsory round with barely any false movements. Moving into the compulsory tumbling heat, the Bobcats were sturdy on their jumps to back tuck, but then Steph Palangi took a big step instead of sticking her landing. In the optional tumbling trio round, Azusa had three solid full and a halfs with landings that were nearly synchronized. Quinnipiac fought back in the quad tumbling pass with a perfect whip handspring handspring to full. Azusa fell to the Bobcats 267.05 to 264.54. Would QU be able to take home the national title against the Oregon Ducks? Let's see. Starting off the Meet QU performed their compulsory stunt heat, Trisha Pierce and Montero Thomas said he prepared for the rewinds, but then Pierce's bases almost missed Pierce's feet, but were able to recover and push her to her heel stretch. Then on the dismount, Pierce and Thomas said he barely made their double downs all the way around, a little sloppy for the QU. Oregon then also performed their compulsory stunt heat. Sarah Morno and Chandler White had extremely clean heel stretches. They stayed tight on the power press to arabesque through to the dismount. The Bobcats then competed their optional basket toss. Christina Lasto and Pierce performed front double fulls, but Pierce's was slightly messy with bent legs. Oregon then moved on to their optional basket toss and was nearly perfect with a clean front kick double full. Then battling through the tumbling rounds, Oregon with a perfect synchronized whip, whip, whip through to full. Extremely impressive. Montero Tomasetti then competed her open tumbling heat with an injured left ankle, but still did a perfect full and a half through to full. A few bobbles in the team routine for the Bobcats, but a solid stunt sequence for them. Then moving on to the dismount, perfect, almost synchronized. Oregon opened up their team routine with a slight stumble from Miranda Murkison and her base, but were able to move on to jumps fine. Extremely clean triple toe backs from the Ducks. Oregon defeated QU 277.885 to 273.655 and won the national title for the third season in a row. The softball team played host to the Central Connecticut State Blue Devils for a doubleheader Sunday afternoon. Fresh off two losses on Saturday versus Bryant, Quinnipiac was looking to bounce back. How would Bobcat fail? Let's find out. Quinnipiac and CCSU pregame senior day ceremony honoring Alex Alvarez, Bridget Pignick, Courtney Kessis, and Lauren Salgado. Sophomore Hannah Winsley gets the start for the Bobcats, warming up here, but she's going to have a bit of a rough day. Scoreless in the top of the third. Winsley commits a throwing error and then gives up an RBI double right here to Cat Malcolm. And that's going to allow Ariel Bruno to come in and score here now. Rounding third coming in, takes the 1 0 lead for CCSU. They're not done yet, though. Malcolm. On base, going to score on this RBI single right here by Nicole Springer. Blue Devils leading 2-0, end of the third. Going to the fifth now. Bruno, leadoff home run off Lindsay. 
two left field. CCSU up three to nothing. She's having herself a pretty good day. Winsley struggling, still in the fifth year. After a Malcolm single, Springer again with an RBI double. Here it comes. And CCSU really starting to pour it on. This is going to make it four to nothing once Springer is, or excuse me, once Malcolm scores. Four nothing right there, and that's only the half of it, literally. The Bobcats struggling, making a pitching change, going to Nicole Gubalini. She's going to take over, not going to fare much better. CCSU continues to dominate. Kelsey Barlow with a home run as soon as Gubalini comes in. Springer scores on that. The Blue Devils would score four more runs to make it nine to nothing. Absolutely dominating today against the Bobcats. Bottom five now, two outs. Wouldn't the act down to their final strike? Abby Johnson strikes out to end the game. That will do it. CCSU wins 9-0. Bobcats fall to 15-30 on the season. Central Connecticut State defeated Quinnipiac again 10-2 in Game 2 of Sunday's doubleheader. Following the weekend, the Bobcats' record is 15-31, including 8-8 eight eight in the Northeast Conference play. The Bobcats take the field again this coming Thursday, May 2nd, versus Manhattan. Then they finish their season in they finish their season on the road versus Robert Morris and at St. Francis University this Saturday, May 4th, and Sunday, May 5th. Earlier today, I caught up with our analyst, Colin Babcock, to talk some softball. Thanks for joining me, Colin. Always a pleasure, Arthur. As it stands, the Quinnipiac softball team is currently tied in fifth place with four NEC games to go. So, who is going to have to step up to carry them the rest of the year? Well, Arthur, it's going to have to be those four seniors on the team. The center fielder, Lauren Salgado, the shortstop, Alex Alba, the third baseman, Bridget Figmick, and the first baseman, Courtney Kessels. These girls have been playing on the Quinnipiac turf for four years. They have the most amount of experience, and they really need to pick up their play for some of the younger players to see what it means to you know, be a Bobcat and to make a long run into the playoffs. And what is your biggest concern for this team in the last four games? My biggest concern has been the pitching. They've allowed way too many runs. You look at Central Connecticut State, nine runs in the first game. And how about against Bryant? 17 runs in two games. It's not acceptable. Pitchers need to hit their spot, induce ground balls, and get out of innings quick before they get into trouble. Like I said earlier, four NEC games to go. What is their shot at making the playoffs? I don't see them making the playoffs, Arthur. Teams want to get hot around this type of year, and they've been getting cold, losing four straight games. And plus, they're going to have to be playing Robert Morris in a two-game series, who's in first place of the NEC Conference. I don't like their chances there, and I don't like their chances of making it into the playoffs. Thanks for that, Colin. Back to you guys. The Quinnipiac women's track team took a trip to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania to compete in the Penn Relays at the University of Pennsylvania. It's the world's largest track meet, and very prestigious one at that. The three-day event at the Penn Relays in Franklin Field yielded some very, very good performances, including record-breaking ones. On Thursday, Andrea Zarkowitz broke the school record in the 3,000-meter steeplechase with a time of 10 minutes and 7 seconds. The Bob posted school record in the distance medley relay. The team of Rachel Morelli, Shamil Samuels, Hannah Donatio, and Tracy Campbell posted a time of 12 minutes and 5 seconds. The Bobcats broke another school record on Saturday when they were able to break the record in the 4 by 800 meter relay. Chelsea Savage, Donatio again, Hannah, or excuse me, Med Medina Nabuduka, Katie Petrie were able to break the time with a t time of 9 minutes and 10 seconds. It's time for our first break here on Sports Pause, but Arthur and I are just getting warmed up, and we've got plenty more QU Sports coverage coming your way. We'll recap men's lacrosse, bring you baseball highlights, and a feature about the unique landscape of the Quinnipiac baseball field. I could really go for a Ray and Mike sub right now. Come to Ray and Mike's and try our Philly chicken with cheese for just over $4, giant cheesesteak subs, and mouth-watering boar's head sandwiches for as low as $4.75. Cue cash accepted just a mile down the road on Whitney here at Ray and Mike's. Welcome back. This weekend, men's lacrosse went out to Moon Township, Pennsylvania to take on the Colonials of Robert Morris. With the one seed in the Northeast Conference Tournament on the line, the Bobcats jumped out to a 6-1 lead, but couldn't hold on as they lost 9-7. The Bobcats had seven different scores, and Gil Connors tallied 15 saves in net with the loss. The Bobcats are the three seed and will play Robert Morris once again in the NEC semifinals Thursday at Bryant University. 
The Wagner Seahawks baseball team visited Hamden for a four-game weekend set with the Bobcats. Quinnipiac entered the weekend in the midst of a 13-game slide. The Bobcats look to stop the losing streak starting on Friday at 3 p.m. Let's see who took game one. Bobcats, as I said, on that big losing streak, looking to get back on track. Quinnipiac ace Derek Lamacchia on the mound, entering the game with a 3-5 record. Despite the ERA just above two, already, so not really getting the run support he would like, and he probably won't get any today either, as Ryan Casey on the mound for Wagner, and very good pitcher, three and four coming into the game with three complete games. Let's jump to the sixth inning now. Top six, Bobcats leading by two, 2-0. Two After two hits, they're now to start the inning. The Seahawks get aggressive, and they execute a double steal. Nick Dinney moves into third. Chase Gray moves to second, catching the Bobcats asleep, puts Lamaki in a tough spot. That'll bring Sean Flynn to the plate with a big opportunity for Wagner, and he's going to come through. Hanging slider coming up here by Lamakia and a single up the middle just past the diving Forrest Dwyer. Dinny and Gray come in to score. Wagner erases the Quinnipiac lead, went from 2-0 to 2-2 just like that, but they're not done. After a single and a wild pitch that moves Flynn to third, Nick Alfano singles to center. That brings Flynn in to give Wagner the 3-2 lead to the Bobcats now find themselves trailing for the first time in the game. We're going to jump to the bottom of the eighth now. Quinnipiac threatening. We've got the bases loaded, only one out. Slugger Vin Galetti at the plate. He's going to hit this one hard on the ground, but unfortunately right at Chase. And he scoops it up. Chase Gray scoops it up on the second, on the first. Double play. Bottom nine we go. Bobcats still trailing. Down to their last out. Threatening again. Stefan Herter going to beat this throw out. Get over to first base. Keeps the Bobcats alive. And giving them some hope. Brings Tom Donovan to the plate as the go-ahead run. But short dribbler down the first base line, scooped up by Casey, who makes a nice play right here, seals the deal for Wagner, earns himself the victory. Goes the distance with two earned runs on eight hits. No strikeouts, though, but improves his record to four and four with his fourth complete game. Lamaki also goes the distance with six strikeouts, but takes the loss, and his record drops to three and six. Following Friday's loss, the Bobcats were back at it Saturday with a double dip against Wagner. To the diamond we go. Beautiful day as baseball takes on Wagner for the first game of the double dip. Nick Alfano here ripping a ball out to center field for the signal as Stefan Hurton chases it down for the Bobcats. Spencer Kane here gives up the double to chase Gray on the fastball as he gets an RBI and moves a runner over to third. Wagner takes the lead one to nothing. Bobcats trying to get something started, but Ryan Nelson grounds out to second to end the inning, and to the third we go. Here, Tommy Mazurkowitz grounds out to short to end the top half of the inning, but in the fifth, Jason Keel starts off the inning with a double for the Seahawks to put himself in scoring position, and this is where things got very interesting. Next batter, Nick Alfano chops one up the third baseline, but the throw is off and Alfano is safe. Wagner later scored to make it 3-1 Seahawks. Another ground out for the Bobcats as they just could not get the offense clicking. And here he is again, folks. Nick Alfano singles to load the bases for the Seahawks, but they don't cash in. Scott Downahue tries to make a push for the Bobcats in the last inning with a single, but the Bobcats fall short 3-1 and drop to 10-27 on the year. After the weekend sweep, the Bobcats sit in seventh place ahead of only Fairleigh Dickinson and Mount St. Mary's. They currently sit six games out of an NEC playoff spot. There are 14 games remaining on the Bobcats' schedule, 12 of which are conference matchups. The team travels to LIU Brooklyn, returns home for Central Connecticut State, and will wrap up the season May 18th at Fairleigh Dickinson. Well, Artie, when you want to hit the ball the opposite way, you keep your hands in. When you have a question about Quinnipiac baseball, you bring in Giovanni Mio. I caught up with Gio earlier to talk some Bobcats baseball. All right, Gio. The baseball team is really struggling. They've lost 17 games in a row now with this sweep at the hands of Wagner here at home in the four-game series this weekend. What's going on with the baseball team? Well, Mark, I can tell you this. The team has not been able to close out games, let alone be in them. I mean, during the 17-game losing streak, the Bobcats have been in a lot of games where they've been only down one or two runs in the ninth inning, but they just can't seem to get to hitting when it matters. And most importantly, they're pitching. Minus Derek Lamacchia, the team has not really been able to be stabilized during the latter parts of the games, and that's what costs them later on. 
So mostly it's been a combination of not hitting in the right spots and then pitching and blowing away games when it does matter. Now you mentioned the pitching and you said aside from Derek Lamacchia because obviously he's the ace of this staff. What's, what's going on with all the other pitchers? When you throw fastballs down the middle repeatedly, the batters are going to adjust and hit them, especially in Division I college baseball. What the pitchers should try and do is work the count a lot more. If you have an 0-2 count, don't throw a fastball down the middle. Go high. Make the batters switch their eye and then maybe catch them off guard. It just seems like every time the Bobcats pitch, they're always trying to go for strikes consistently. Always try to change the batter's eye, throw some curveballs, get a slider in there. I mean, fastball changeup, we both know, is a great combination. If they can try and get that working, minus Lamakia, they have a chance of winning a few more games before the season, season ends. And now I mentioned the sweep this weekend against Wagner, but all those games were pretty close games. They weren't really blown out in any of them. What does that do for the morale of this team? They haven't won in nearly a month. Well, Wagner is currently fourth in the conference. So when you're on a losing streak that's nearly hitting one month now, and losing four straight games by one run pretty much in each game, minus one where they lost by two runs, on your home turf against a team like Wagner, it should boost morale. I mean, trust me, winning only 10 games so far is not really a great thing to brag about, but they're in all these games. In one game, Lamakia pitched, and they had the lead all the way until the sixth inning. They were up 2 nothing, but then Lamakia got gave up, gave up three runs in one inning, but the Bobcats offense couldn't respond. So they've been able to dominate at least certain parts of the game with one dimension, but like you know in baseball, you need both hitting and pitching. It's just right now what you can say as positive is they're doing well hitting-wise. It's just sometimes minus one outing per five starts from Lamakia, the pitching has been subpar. When is this losing streak finally going to come to an end? I think it will end on Wednesday when they face UMass. UMass is currently a record of 10 and 24. The Bobcats have 10 wins themselves, and UMass doesn't really have the greatest pitching as well. So you could possibly see a high-scoring game where Quinnipiac comes out on top, especially with a team that's pretty much doing as okay as you are so far in the season. Okay, Gio, as always, thank you. Giovanni Mio, always smooth. Back to the desk. Arthur, what do you think of Quinnipiac's campus? It's gorgeous. What do you think about the athletic fields? They're fantastic. How about the baseball field? Well, I heard there's a hill in the outfield, and I heard you learned a little bit about it. Let's check it out. Quinnipiac University has a beautiful campus. With an exceptional library, gorgeous quad, and some very nice housing, the campus is hard to beat. Right in the middle of it all is the Quinnipiac Bobcats baseball field. And Quinnipiac baseball head coach Dan Gooley likes it that way. Well, it's in the center of campus. You know, we, uh, we play at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, generally speaking, or maybe a 1 o'clock game on the weekends. And we get a lot of people who come, a lot of students who show up. They may only be with us an hour before they go to another class. I, I, it's a very unique experience to have your facility right in the center of campus. And it's so available to uh, anyone who wants to come out and see a game, you know, with our parking. So this is a very unique place to play. It really is. And it's, uh, it's very exciting on game day. But that's not the only unique thing about Quinnipiac's baseball field. There's a big hill that runs from center to the right field line. And the Bobcats use that as home field advantage. I used to play out right field two years ago before my redshirt year. It's definitely something you have to get used to, but it is a home field advantage. You see kids run up there and legs will buckle and they'll go down. It's always a good sight to see. But how do the Bobcats prepare for using it as home field advantage? Uh, well, I mean, almost every day we work on it in practice. So uh, we'll go out there, we'll get our bearings down. We'll, we'll get about five, 10 feet away from it, try and figure out how many steps it takes us to get to the bottom of it so that we know when it's coming on. Because as you approach it, you got to get some choppy steps going up it and make sure that you don't trip and fall. We've seen numerous teams from all over come in and we get base hits, doubles, triples because kids try and run up it and they end up falling. We make it known that we need to work on it. So it's a, it's a big deal for us to make sure that we perfect it compared to other teams. And in games, Quinnipiac captain Chris McGanny says the more the outfielders talk, the better. It's going back on balls, knowing where the hill is, communication with the center fielder, letting you know how, far, how much room you got before the hill and then the fence. So just communication and, and going back on balls, going up the hill. But because the ridge runs from center to right, depending on where the outfielders are, can change the way they play the ball. Center's, center's a little bit tougher because it's tougher to judge the distance from it because the angles you have to take. So right, you kind of know exactly where it is every time you're onto it. In center, it might be 15 steps on one ball, it might be 20 steps on another ball. So. I think it's a tougher adjustment from center field. That hill in the Bobcats outfield is often referred to as a ridge, Rizzo's Ridge, and that name comes with good reason. 
Well, it's uh, it's called Rizzo's Ridge after a player that was here for four years. His name was Ryan Rizzo. And he came in as a freshman in 2004. And he stepped into right field and played there every single game, every single inning, every single play for four years. And was outstanding defensively. And he would practice and play on that ridge in right field, in right center, and in center field every day. Uh, he would work out in center field just so he knew where the ridge was. He would work out in right field. And he got so good at it, he made every play defensively in the outfield. Ground balls, fly balls. He took away home runs. He took away doubles because he knew exactly how to play the ridge. And so I decided, you know what, out of total respect, I was going to rename it Rizzo's Ridge. For Sports Paws, I'm Mark Spillane. Good field. Thanks for that, Mark. Well, we've come to intermission number two. We will step aside for the Zambonis, but once we come back, we will tell you how women's golf fared in the NEC championships, bring you the tweet of the week, and review the most successful year in Bobcats history. Stay tuned. I could really go for a Ray and Mike sub right now. Come to Ray and Mike's and try our Philly chicken with cheese for just over $4, giant cheesesteak subs, and mouth-watering boar's head sandwiches for as low as $4.75. Cue cash accepted just a mile down the road on Whitney here at Ray and Mike's. Welcome back to Sports Paws, everyone. It's that time again. And what time is that, Artie? Tweeting time. Our very own Chelsea Barada scoured Twitter to find our Tweet of the Week. Hi, my name is Chelsea Barada, and this is Sports Paws Tweet of the Week. The tweet comes from Quinnipiac's women's golf coach, John O'Connor, who tweeted, on our way to our conference championship and warm weather. The women's golf team traveled to the Northeast Conference Championship at LPGA International in Daytona, Florida. Now back to Mark in the studio to learn more. The Quinnipiac women's golf squad flew south of Daytona Beach, Florida for the NEC championships this weekend. The Bobcats finished in seventh place with a total score of 981, 117 shots over par. Long Island University won the tournament with a total score of 942. Quinnipiac was led by Kayla Ketchison and Chrissy Unger, who each shot totals of 242 on the weekend. Well, Arthur, it's been quite a successful year for Quinnipiac sports. What a great year for Bobcats fans. A regular season championship for the men's soccer team. A Northeast Conference title and NCAA berth for the women's basketball squad. A regular season ECAC championship, national title game appearance, and Hobie Baker nomination for the men's ice hockey team. And now women's rugby sets their sights on the national championship at Stanford University in California. It's been a year so full of success that only a feature piece could capture it all. Carolyn Fales has the story. Well, I came to Quinnipiac in 1978, and as I tell people all the time, I mean, I, if you could spell Quinnipiac in 1978, we gave you an academic scholarship. The 2012-2013 season highlights the tremendous growth of Quinnipiac athletics. From men's hockey to women's basketball and beyond, the success of the Bobcats this season is incomparable to prior seasons. Um, I've been at Quinnipiac University for 12 years, um, and I've seen the athletic program here grow substantially and mature in ways that I don't think any of us would have predicted a dozen years ago. While the name's the same in terms of Quinnipiac uh, and the mom and shop quality in terms of the caring community is still there, uh, it's grown exponentially. It is, it is one of the best kept secrets in, in, in college athletics today. Quinnipiac saw many firsts, including the women's basketball team making their first NCAA berth after winning the NEC championship. My favorite moment this season is definitely having that time run out, that buzzer go off in the championship game and just feeling that awesome excitement throughout the whole stadium. It was just an amazing feeling. When I finally became a senior, you've seen it all put together. They had great players, great chemistry. We worked hard. We had hearts of lions. It was amazing and it was just a great, like, experience to see our program grow so much throughout my four years. Men's soccer saw an impressive run as well. This year our, our coach did an excellent, our coaching staff did an excellent job of getting guys to buy into the program coming each day to training 100%, 110%, not uh, 
I don't really feel like training today. With the move to the Metro Atlantic Athletic Conference next year, Quinnipiac Athletics will face more challenges on their way to success. Well, I've always told people, and I firmly believe this, that uh, it's a lot easier getting to the top than it is staying on top. I mean, I think it can only go up, right? I mean, this year was fantastic. Unfortunately, the playoffs didn't go as how we wanted, but a new league, new players is always exciting, but I think it's going to be fun to watch them. As long as we don't take shortcuts, I think we'll continue to be knocking on the door of conference championships and NCAA births. The 2012-2013 athletic season will not be forgotten anytime soon. Uh, there's something about a university that has great spirit. There's something about a university that attracts quality students like we do. And I think we um, boosted our profile because of the performance of our athletic teams. And everybody wants to be with a winner, so I expect more and more students to wish to come here because they want to be with a winner too. Just having an opportunity to be part of something as great spirited as Quinnipiac Athletics and just having a little piece of it, um, those are my happiest days. This has been a year Bobcats fans will never forget and we've been delighted to bring you all the coverage. But we'll be back next fall for a new year of Quinnipiac sports. For more information on the show or the station in general, check out www.q30.org. And follow us on Twitter at Q30Sports. Also, be sure to check out the Bobcat shop for all your Quinnipiac apparel. But Arthur, wait, there's more. Be sure to be on the lookout for a special look behind the scenes of Sports Paws coming soon to the Q30 YouTube page. Until next year, I'm Arthur Lane. And I'm Mark Spillane. We now leave you with one final highlight reel to capture the year's events. Good night, everyone. Lay and pass over to Brittany McQueen. And on a day the world celebrates luck, the Bobcats make their own. The Quinnipiac Bobcats are going dancing. Northeast Conference champions for the first time. The Quinnipiac Bobcats are the number one team in the country. They are led by goaltender Eric Hartzell. Bobcats into the Bulldogs zone. A shot, they score! His brother with him, a shot, he scores! Kellen Jones! We're gonna go cross ice. Here comes Bowie left side. Bowie holds oh, back and scores. Kevin <laughs> Bowie wins it in overtime, and the Bobcats are headed to Atlantic City. Jones in all alone, backhand, he scores.